Yo, top of the morning to you, wealth champions. Y'all know what it is, man. It is time for the Cortez Hustle Show Friday edition, Black Economic Empowerment Hour. Yes, it is about to go down, man. We talk solutions around here, man. How do we um, position ourselves to do for self? And like Professor James Small says, we should be looking to take care of our five core basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security. And this is a six-part series that we're running down, and we are on part number two, where the focus is, my friend, on clothing. What will it look like if we produce our own clothing? We're going to get into that today, man. We've got a wonderful show packed out for you. So we're talking about manufacturing our own clothing. We're talking about the three major uh, materials used in clothing manufacturing. And then we're going to get into the hidden money in manufacturing that you all need to know about. So let's roll the intro and get right into it. Put the hip shit on the shelf Cause the way the real web is being real with self My eyes done seen the glory of the coming of the left I can't do it by myself, so I'm asking for help It's time to switch it up, put the hip shit on the shelf Cause the way the real web is being real with self My eyes done seen the glory of the coming of the left I can't do it by myself, so I'm asking for help Money, money, money That's all you talk about wrong with being wealthy like Kanye West says, having money is not everything, not having it is. No, Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, God gives us the ability to create wealth. No, it's the love of money that's the root of all life. Yes, I do think about other things than money. I'm just trying to leave a legacy for money. Money's not everything, but when you got it, you can do some cool stuff. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Cortez Hustle Show. I am your host, of course, Cortez Hustle, the one and only financial health mentor, everybody's favorite fatherpreneur, coming to you live and direct from the Monetize My Life studios here in St. Louis, Missouri. Listen, if you are not familiar with my best-selling book, Monetize My Life, it's four incredibly simple ways to turn your passions into profits with little to no startup costs. I need you to do me a huge favor, man. Go over to uh, monetizemylifenow.com www.monetizemylifenow.com and get your free copy all you got to do is cover shipping and we'll get it right out to you do me a huge favor ladies and gentlemen if you are checking us out on facebook youtube or any live streaming platform make sure you comment in the chat where you're from also drop the name of your business and or your brand love to give you a free shout out uh, let me grab a couple of my other monitors here and uh, I want to help us better understand why it makes more sense for us to focus on solutions than it does problems. See, first of all, when you are focused on your problems, ladies and gentlemen, no matter what they are, you literally make those problems bigger, right? When you focus on your problem, you literally magnify the problem because that's what you're focused on. The same thing happens, though, when you focus on the solutions. See, when you focus on the solutions, you make your solutions bigger and you make your problems smaller. So that's what we want to focus on. Um, we started our uh, six-part series last week where we focused on what it would look like if we simply provided the food that we consume, right? What if we did just that? And uh, I'm here to tell you, man, we talk about one of the greatest wealth transfers that's happening uh, in the world right now, right? That is you know, the whole COVID, the whole protest, all of this stuff, while we are being distracted, there's a lot of wealth being transferred in the background. Well, let me talk to you guys before we get into uh, our clothing manufacturing discussion today. Let me talk to you guys about a huge talent and skill set transfer that took place right at the end of slavery. 
I don't know if you guys know this or not, but slaves were not just in the fields, <laughs> right? I know when we watch a slave movie, we tend to believe that slavery was only the field Negro or the house Negro. Well, let me ask you a question. If you have the ability to get free labor from an entire uh, section of the population, would you limit that free labor to just picking cotton and working in the fields? Of course you wouldn't. And neither did our slave masters. Ladies and gentlemen, slaves were masters at every skill, right? And what happened when slavery ended and you had a bunch of highly skilled individuals enter into a capitalistic workforce where you're able to sell your skills for whatever it is that you would be willing to accept for those skills. You know what happened? We intimidated the dominant society because they said, listen, if all these master carpenters, plumbers, electricians, roofers, millers, uh, uh, lumbermen and, and women and uh, um, uh, laborers from all walks of life entered the workforce who were used to working for free, now have the ability to come after my job when I'm getting paid X amount of dollars per hour, shoot, they're going to be able to undercut me, man. Uh, so what happened was the formation of the labor unions and the certifying boards, right? I want you guys to understand this. We left slavery with a lot of skills, but no formal education. We left slavery um, you know, with the ability, if they were paying the average person, you know, a dollar an hour, 50 cent an hour, we were used to working for free. So we gonna come on the scene and say, hey man, pay me 10 cents an hour. That's better than free. And we'll accept that. So what they did was they began to form the labor unions. And the labor unions were whites only. So when you think about an, an uh, uh, extremely skilled people with the ability to come take jobs from the dominant society, they banded together and created these unions and they kept black people out. So black people could not get jobs. But you know what happens in America when you can't get a job, but you have a skill? You put your skill to the test. And that's what black people did. Say, okay, you won't hire us on your job, man, but I'm a master carpenter. I know how to build a house. I know how to build a cabin. I don't know how to build a table. You won't hire me on your job. But guess what? I've been a blacksmith since I was old enough to uh, hold a hammer. I've been this. I've been that. So I've got all these skills. So black people went to work and went into business for themselves. But then you know what happened after that? Say, wait a minute. Even though you are a master at this skill, you can't practice your livelihood because you aren't certified. Meaning, you've got to go take a test to prove that you can do what it is that you claim you can do as a professional. Well, let's think about that for a second. We were highly skilled in all of the trades. Anything that you can think of, we had those skill sets. Because of the way slavery worked, those skill sets were also allowed to be passed down to our children. You take somebody who is highly skilled, but you add to the fact that it was illegal for us to learn how to read and write. So all of a sudden, we've got all of this skill, all of this talent flooding into the marketplace, and we are ready to pull ourselves up by our proverbial bootstraps. And that's exactly what we were doing. And then they said, wait a minute, you can't practice those skills because you don't have a license or a certification, or in other words, you have not been granted permission by the city, state, or county, or even the 
federal government to practice that skill. So we said, hey, no problem. We need to go prove that we can do what we can do. Let me go ahead and build you something and I'll show you that I can do what I can do. He said, no, no, no. It's, it, we're gonna, that's going to be part of the test. But another part of the test is the written part. The read and ask question, answer questions part. And y'all know that was a problem for us, right? Because it was illegal for us to learn how to read and write. So you have the certifying boards um, stopping us from making a livelihood with our hands, which we had been doing. And we had mastered many different skill sets in pretty much every discipline. But because we can't pass a test, because we never learned how to read and write, we cannot use that skill set to build a business from and to create a legacy of wealth based on that skill set, ladies and gentlemen. So the games have been, you know, rigged and been played for a long time, right? So you know what happened? We're talking about one of the greatest uh, uh, transfers of skill set and talent. See, we know a transfer of wealth is happening right now during COVID, but one of the, the, the greatest ways that our wealth was stolen from us, transferred from us, was when we were released from slavery. We had the skills to do any and everything for ourselves. But then the certifying boards came in and says, hey, unless you are certified to do this, meaning you've passed a written exam, you've passed a uh, hands-on exam so you can prove it through demonstration, but you also should be able to prove it through scholar. But we were people who it was illegal for us to learn how to read and write. So we didn't have the ability to pass these tests. So you know what we did? It was at that point we stopped passing down these skill sets to our children. Because if we didn't know how to read, they didn't know how to read. And instead of them helping us, uh, you know, in the blacksmith shop, instead of helping us uh, build cabinets, instead of helping the parents uh, farm and garden and do all of these things, they say, hey, listen, we got these skills, but we're not able to put food on the table for these because of these skills, because we can't read and write. So instead of you learning these skills that in any other situation in the planet should be able to put food on the table, we're going to send you to school and you're going to go and learn how to read and write. Most of your day. Right. So instead of the skill being passed down from generation to generation like it had been in the past. We saw and we thought we were doing the smart thing by saying, hey, do not pursue this skill because this skill won't be able to feed you unless you can read and write. And then you send them off to school where they learn to read and write, but they also learn a bunch of other stuff that distracts them away from learning the family business, the family trade, the family skill. Why am I bringing all this up and we're supposed to be talking about manufacturing our own clothing? Because last week we talked about manufacturing our own food. And if we are ever going to get to a place where we can produce this stuff in enough quantities from raw material to retail, then we're going to have to bring our children back to the trade of farming, cultivating, back to the trade of raising animals, back to the trade. See, we've got to bring the next generation back to doing the things that we need for them to do in the next 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, right? But we didn't do that. The reason we, we gave up those skills is because we couldn't read and write to pass a test to get certified. Therefore, we couldn't legally work and build businesses around our skills. But come on, best believe we know good and doggone well they used our skills we just couldn't build a business for ourselves. Well, I couldn't get licensed. I couldn't get certified. So that means I couldn't get credit. I couldn't start my own thing. But 
you can hire me as a laborer. All the while, I'm a journeyman carpenter, a master carpenter. So you pay me as a laborer, but I do journeyman master carpenter work all because I never learned how to read. So I can't pass a test to get certified and licensed so that I can open my own thing with my superior skills. Got to bring the children back to the skill sets, to the things that we need to be doing for ourselves bringing them back to the farm. So that was a recap on last week's. This week, we're talking about what would it look like if we produced our own clothing? Ladies and gentlemen, if we produced our own clothing, we would create tens of thousands of jobs easily if we started to focus on manufacturing our own clothing. See, we understand retail, buy it at a wholesale price, then turn around and sell it for the suggested retail price or better so that you can make a profit, right? And that's good. We need retail outlets. But then we also understand it from a design standpoint. We've got some of the best clothing and fashion designers on the planet designing the fly outfits. You know, I think about, uh, man, his name escaping me right now. Dapper, Dapper Don, right? Um, took a lot of existing brands and customized them so well and so much. It became so popular that those brands brought him in as a consultant, right? Those brands brought him in to help them uh, move fashion forward in a way that it appeals to black people, right? So we understand retail. We understand design. Now it's time for us to understand the manufacturing and the production of the raw materials because that's where all the jobs are created. I want you to think about something. You got a retail outlet and you learn to hire a few people to help you run that store. Stores open 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. You got two shifts. You might have 10 people working the store at any shift. So that's 20 people per day working. And that's great. We're providing jobs for our people. We're providing ways for people to spend and recycle the black dollar in our community. Wonderful. But now it's time for us to kick it up a notch. We've got people who are taking their gifts and talents and they're designing some of the flyest stuff that you can drape across your body. Right. But usually those designs are then um, formed out to another outfit to make the manufacturing and the production of. It's time for us to get into the manufacturing and the production of if we're going to create jobs at mass. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you doing what you can, you hiring four, five, ten people uh, in your own operation. Yes, if lots of us were doing that all across the country, then yes, we're creating jobs. But I'm talking about creating thousands of jobs in the manufacturing side, right? So there's three main materials that we're going to focus on and as we think about uh, creating these um, creating you know, or manufacturing our own clothes. In fact, I'm going to add a fourth one to the list because I didn't even think about this, but let me look up this fourth one and on the other side of this break, we're going to talk more about those three main materials, four main materials that we should be manufacturing, but then I want to give you some of the hidden money in manufacturing that people, this is why we got to be producers, y'all, because there's a lot of money left on the table because we're not producing. So on the other side of this break, we're going to continue the discussion. Leave me your comments, man. Let me know your thoughts on some of this stuff. Am I barking up the right tree? Are we going down the right path? Is this a potential solution to create jobs for our people? So now this out of this break, man, I want y'all to keep it locked right here for more of the Cortez Hustle Show.
Cortez Hustle Show is brought to you by Financial Health Mentor, practical proven wealth building strategies specifically for working class Americans. Go to financialhealthmembership.com to learn how to get your taxes down, credit up, get out of debt, and start accumulating assets. Financialhealthmembership.com. Cortez Hustle Show is also brought to you by freefunnelmachine.com. If you've ever wanted to use sales funnels in your business, but not quite ready to fork over hundreds of dollars per month for funnel building software, then now you can incorporate sales funnels into your process absolutely free. Freefunnelmachine.com includes free autoresponder, includes free training, and it is free for life. Freefunnelmachine.com. The Cortez Hustle Show is also brought to you by Office Puddle Print Shop. All of the graphic designs, logos that you see for iHustle Media Group and the Cortez Hustle Show are courtesy of Office Huddle Print Shop. Check out their exclusive unlimited graphics package at officehuddleprints.com. The Cortez Hustle Show is a copyrighted production of iHustle Media Group. Any unauthorized use of the video, captions, audio, depictions of this show is strictly prohibited. iHustle Media Group, a better way to market. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Cortez Hustle Show. Uh, I'm your host, Cortez Hustle, and we're coming to you live and direct from the Monetize My Life studios here in St. Louis, Missouri. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, you've all been given a gift, talent, special ability from your creator. And if you would learn how to package and present that to the marketplace, you can turn that special gift, talent, experience, expertise, know-how into income. And that's what my book, Monetize My Life, is all about. All you got to do is go to monetizemylifenow.com. You'll get yourself a free copy of that book. And then you just pay shipping and I'll get it right out to you. Um, you can also join our group once you get your free book. And we're doing a free uh, live Q&A about how to turn your gifts into uh, uh, profits this weekend. So uh, if you get the book today, then I'll send you that link to join that free conversation where I'm going to do some training on how to expose people to what you know. And that's the first foundational step to turning your passions into profits. We're talking here today about how we can empower ourselves economically by providing the five basic elements that every culture is, <clears throat> excuse me, providing for themselves that we as black people are not. Food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security. Every other culture on the planet provides these five core elements for themselves, except black people, especially black people here in America, right? So if we focus only on laying the foundation of providing these things from ourselves, and when I say lay the foundation, I mean the end goal is to own industry from raw material to retail. That's the end goal, right? But I realize we've got to start somewhere. But if we don't start with the end in mind, we'll get a few retail shops and then that'll be it. If we don't start with the end in mind, maybe we'll get a distribution partnership and that'll be it. No, the end goal is to own industry from raw material all the way through to retail. Because that, my friend, is where all the jobs are created. Do me a huge, huge, huge favor. For those of you who are tuning in on YouTube and Facebook, I need you to do me a favor right, right now smash that share button ladies and gentlemen and let's get more people involved in this conversation because i think this is the difference between us ultimately getting to the place where not only are we doing for self uh, but we can curb some of the racism that we are experiencing we can cut down on some of the um police brutality and the shooting of unarmed and killing of unarmed black men and women in this country when we become more producers and we become more economically sound. So four major materials that are used in 
clothing production, right? What are they? We know the number one is cotton. So we're talking about what can we do if we start producing our own clothing and the goal is from raw material to retail, be heavily involved in the ownership aspect of these things and these steps, uh, this, this chain every step of the way. How could that help us economically and create tens of thousands of jobs while doing something that needs to be done anyway? So if we look at cotton, for instance, a lot of people don't realize that cotton is still a cash crop. What do I mean? If you think about what it takes to grow cotton, you need some land, you need some cotton seeds, and heck, God provides the rest. <laughs> you need some land and you need some cotton seeds and God is going to provide the sunshine and the rain. And you grow a material that's highly profitable, right? If we were to grow cotton at mass, how many jobs would that create? Think about it. You got the, 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 the farmer who owns the land. You got the farmer who tills the land. You got the farmer who plants the seed. You got the farmer who cares for the crop. You got the farmers and the production means that harvests the crop. Then you got the, uh, the production team that processes the cotton and turns it uh, and, and cleans it and, and gets it ready. And then you got the team that uh, spins the cotton into fabric. Then you've got the uh, people who take that fabric and they turn it into wearable clothing items, whether it is a t-shirt or whether it is denim jeans, how many jobs would that create? Cotton, number one. Then we know that clothing is made from wool as well. How, same thing. You've got wool that comes from sheep. What does it take to care for sheep? Needs some land? Uh, you, you need, you know, obviously the know-how, but if you think about it, how many jobs can that create if you started to build a sheep farm? And, and here's what I want, want to, us to understand. We get so caught up in uh, coming out of the gate strong. We want to go and borrow tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to create this huge operation. What if you just start with a couple sheep, right? A couple females and a ram. And then y'all know how assets work. Assets reproduce. They grow. So you got your ram and your few sheep. They going to mate and they going to have babies, right? And all the while, you've got wool from the little bit that you have. Now, is it enough wool to sell? Can you produce enough milk from the sheep to sell, to fully care for the sheep? I don't know. I'm not a sheep farmer. I, I don't know. But nevertheless, sometimes when you invest, you invest more on the front end to get out of the back end crazy, crazy, crazy profits. So maybe you're spending more on the front end and you're taking a little bit of wool, you're taking a little bit of milk that you're creating from the few that you have, but those lambs are reproducing. And maybe they are reproducing to the tune of maybe you 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 reproduce three uh, um, little lambs and you sell a couple and you keep one and you keep doing that over and over until eventually you have a whole herd of sheep. Now with a whole herd of sheep, you're getting more and closer to breaking even. But remember what I talked about, the skill set. See, it's, it's tough to take a 15-year-old who's grown up in the city and put him on a sheep farm and have him all excited about 
raising sheep, herding sheep, shearing sheep, processing the wool and the milk and all of that stuff. But what we need is some young couples who got some of this aspiration in them to go and move to the sheep farm and then have their babies and raise their babies where that's all they know is sheep farming. So we got to get back to that. Right. So by the time your child reaches 12, 13, 14 years old, they've already acquired by default five or six marketable skills that they learned on the family farm. See, that knowledge is being skipped. It's skipping generations, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to get back to that transfer of knowledge, skill, and talent, just like we want to transfer the finance, we want to transfer the physical assets, the farm itself, right? So many of our people are dying off our older generations and they don't have anybody to leave the farm to. They don't have anybody to leave the land down south to. And the families are selling off the land. Got to get back to that, the transference of the skills, right? We look at another um, source of material for creating clothing that is has been banned here in America for the for, for the most part. But you're talking about a game changer. Maybe our brothers and sisters up in Canada can get serious about this, and that is hemp. Right. It's the sister plant of cannabis. Right. It is the non psychoactive plant of the cannabis plant. We know the cannabis plant is going to create the THC and the CBD and it's got its purpose. But then you have a hemp plant that has none of that. You can't get high from the hemp plant. But you know what you can do with the hemp plant? You can take the hemp fiber and you can create uh, clothing material that's softer than cotton, that lasts longer than cotton, a material that by nature won't even mildew. And you know what's cool about hemp? Is hemp grows in all 50 states and takes 120 days to get to harvest. Cotton, on the other hand, you get one season, right? How do I know? Because I grow a little cotton every year, man. I, I just got infatuated with it and I, I bought some cotton seeds and I throw them in the ground and I wanted to see what a cotton plant looks like. So I grow cotton every year. I got a couple of plants back there. I'm going to show you guys um, maybe one of these days, uh, my little garden back there when the cotton comes up. But it takes about six months to grow your cotton, cotton to harvest and you need lots of sunshine. Right for the cotton for the cotton to do well, the hemp you can literally grow three to four crops per year, so you get lots of more cotton or uh, lots more fabric per year. In addition, you can grow more cotton, uh, more hemp in the same space. An acre of uh, of cotton will produce so much. Um, material, but an acre of hemp will produce, I believe, twice as much, right? And again, I'm about future thinking. What happens when you start doing this and you bring the kids involved and then you get to be a third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation hemp farmer? See, we got away from that stuff because we didn't believe that there was um, economic stability in farming. Well, a lot of that was due to some racist banking practices and racist uh, uh, economic practices towards our brothers and sisters in the farming community that made it almost non-profitable to run a family farm. 
Things have changed now, ladies and gentlemen. You can have your acreage. You can run your family farms. You can get sustainable banking. You can use sustainable practices to build and run a profitable farm. But we ran off the farm because of some of those things that happened to us in the past. Now it's time for us to go back to those roots, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to provide for ourselves, like Professor James Smalls talks about all the time, food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security. Um, every other culture is providing that for themselves, as well as providing it for others. We've got to get to the place where we're providing that for ourselves. The fourth material that I wanted to uh, put on here was silk. Silk. We know that some of our brothers and sisters can be quite flamboyant, right? And they want some of those higher end materials. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We can produce that stuff from raw material to retail if we only start focusing on it. Do me a huge favor, man. If you've already hit the share button, I want you to comment share that you shared this because we need to start having these conversations that are more based on solutions. When you focus on your problem, you magnify your problem. When you focus on the solutions, you magnify your solutions and your problems get smaller. Your problems get less intimidating. See, what we've done historically in this country, and I don't want to downplay the fact that we have some serious challenges that lie in front of us. I, I don't want to downplay that at all. But what we've done by focusing solely on the problems 90% of the time is we made the problem so big that we don't think we can do anything about it. That problem has become so monstrous that we are in fear of even facing the problem at all. And that's where we are sitting today. So uh, hit the share button, man, if you're checking us out on any of the social media platforms so that uh, we can have more and more people talking about these uh, solutions and not just the problems all the time. Do the problems need to be addressed? Yes. Do the problems need to be identified? Absolutely. If you're going to solve any problem, the first thing you got to do is get to the root cause of that problem. But when you get to the root cause, you better start focusing on some solutions. Otherwise, you're going to make that problem so big that you're going to be intimidated by approaching the problem, trying to overcome the problem, trying to get rid of the problem because you made it so flipping big. Silk is another one of those materials, ladies and gentlemen, that we could start the process of, A, just retailing it. Okay, you start retailing it. Then you, B, you start um, wholesaling it. All right. So now you became the wholesaler and you're selling retail to all the uh, selling wholesale to all the retailers. Then eventually you become the buyer where you're getting straight from the manufacturer the best deals. And you break down what you get as a buyer and you break it down into smaller quantities for your wholesalers. And then your wholesalers will break it down into smaller quantities for the retailers. And then because of your relationships with the manufacturers, you start looking at what does it take to manufacture? You start manufacturing, and then you have to source the raw material from somewhere. Now you start sourcing that raw material, and you, because of your relationships with those that you're sourcing the raw material, you start saying to yourself, well, how can I produce the raw material itself? And in so doing, we create tens of thousands of jobs, ladies and gentlemen. But we got to start with that in mind, owning the process from raw material to retail. So what I'm going to do real quick, man, on the other side of this break, I'm going to introduce you guys to the hidden money in manufacturing. See, this is the part that you would never know about if uh, until you got on the manufacturing side. You're thinking to yourself that, hey, they're selling these, pro these products at these wholesale prices. How are they making any money? Because when you get into 
manufacturing, there are some hidden money in manufacturing. And we're going to talk about that on the other side of this break, man. So I'm excited you guys are hanging out with your boy. Uh, I want you to keep it locked right here. And when we come back, I'm going to show you what a hidden money is on the other side of this break. So keep it locked right here. The Cortez Hustle Show is brought to you by Financial Health Mentor, practical, proven wealth building strategy specifically for working class Americans. Go to financialhealthmembership.com. Learn how to get your taxes down, credit up, get out of debt, and start accumulating assets. Financialhealthmembership.com. Cortez Hustle Show is also brought to you by freefunnelmachine.com. If you've ever wanted to use sales funnels in your business, but not quite ready to fork over hundreds of dollars per month for funnel building software, then now you can incorporate sales funnels into your process absolutely free. Freefunnelmachine.com includes free autoresponder, includes free training, and it is free for life. Freefunnelmachine.com. Of course, this hustle show is also brought to you by Office Puddle Print Shop. All of the graphic designs, logos that you see for iHustle Media Group and the Cortez Hustle Show are courtesy of Office Huddle Print Shop. Check out their exclusive unlimited graphics package at officehuddleprints.com. The Cortez Hustle Show is a copyright production of iHustle Media Group. Any unauthorized use of the video, captions, audio, depiction of this show is strictly prohibited. I hope for media group, a better way to market. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Cortez Hustle Show. I am your host, Cortez Hustle, also known as the one and only financial health mentor, everybody's favorite fatherpreneur. And listen, we're talking about uh, Black economic empowerment. What does it look like if we as Black people started producing the five basic necessities, food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for ourselves with the idea that we will ultimately own these processes from raw material to retail. What would that look like? Can we truly create tens of thousands of jobs for our jobless youth and our jobless men if we focused on production? I believe we can. So this is a six part series. We are on part number two, where we're focusing on producing the clothing that we need. And what would it look like if we only produced the cotton that makes the T-shirts, that makes the underwear, that makes the socks, that makes the sweatpants that I have on. Right. What if we focus only on cotton? Right. As a cash crop, wouldn't, wouldn't that be ironic if. One of the uh, images that we've had burned in our head is black people picking cotton. What if that became the savior of our people? Right? We all started growing cotton and leveraging uh, the cotton and turning it into a source of wealth for us producing our own clothes and our own. And, and that became the thing that we use to turn our whole economic condition around. What? I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just um, too much of a visionary for my own good. But I talked to you guys before we went to break about the hidden money in manufacturing. But we don't know nothing about this money because we don't produce nothing, right? Not to say that in a bad way, because we're doing the best we can with what we have. We're just not going that extra step, that extra mile. Do we got a retail shop? Do we have our restaurants? Absolutely. Do we have some people in wholesaling and, and buying? Absolutely. But we've got to take this thing all the way. So the hidden money and the manufacturing of anything is the byproducts. The hidden money and the manufacturing of anything is a byproduct. That's why you absolutely have to be involved in the raw materials game. We look at one of the four uh, materials that we talked about that comes that we could use to produce our own clothing. We look at cotton. 
what are some of the byproducts of cotton? And this comes from cottontoday.com uh, or actually cottoninc.com. It says cottontoday.cottoninc.com, right? Byproducts of cotton has been cultivated uh, for at least 7,000 years, possibly 12,000 years. The cotton plant is much more than a fiber source. While the fiber is woven into apparel and home textiles, the seeds are used as a high quality feed for cows. The seeds can also be pressed and turned into cottonseed oil that can be used in cooking, as well as cosmetics, soaps, and food products like chips and salad dressing. Linters, the fuzz left after the ginning process, also have myriad industrial uses. Linters from long fibers are often used for medical supplies, while linters from short fibers are used in items ranging from gunpowder to cotton balls and even x-ray film. See, when you get into manufacturing, this is some of the hidden money. So for a long time, when we were when we were sharecroppers, right? And a lot of us did well in sharecropping. I know there's there's a lot of uh, of history of us getting our land seized and basically uh, you know the the masters that we share crop side by side with they created unbearable loans and provided tools. so basically we we went back into slavery but we did come out of it with some land but we produced say the crop of cotton and because of our ignorance of all of these byproducts that comes out of it we sent our cotton to the cotton processors right and they processed the cotton for us and not only did they process the cotton for us and give us the cotton back, chances are they had us pay a disposal fee for all of the material that was left over from the processing of the cotton, right? See, the, the, there's a, a, a great way to build wealth in this country is to take something that someone doesn't want, right? like garbage, trash. You get it for free and you turn around and sell it, right? Th that's a great model for anything in business, right? But the only model that's even greater than that is when you get them to pay you to come and pick it up. Then you take it and sell it. That's an even greater model. And that's what happens in a lot of processing and manufacturing. And you got to understand that. You take your cotton in, you buy the bales, and they're going to charge you to process it. And in that charge of processing, there's a disposal fee for the waste. But really, there is no waste. There is no such thing as waste, ladies and gentlemen. The cotton gets processed. The seeds get separated from the fiber. The... Uh, the stalks, the, you know, the plant itself, the fibers, the wood material that the plant grows on gets uh, uh, separated from the cotton. But that's, there is no such thing as waste, y'all. I want y'all to get that. So you paid to have your stuff processed. They gave you the fibers back so you can take the fibers over and get them turned into uh, fabric or whatever. But they kept the cotton seeds and then they turn those cotton seeds into cotton oil. They turn those cotton seeds into feed for uh, livestock. They turn your stock of the cotton, uh, the plant itself. Let me show you. Uh, let me just scroll down a little bit because it even talks about even the plant of the cotton, which otherwise be considered as trash, um, is, uh, let's see can use to be to create biodegradable packaging that can be composted after use, which much helps control uh, soil erosion uh, is made from byproducts as well. So even the plant itself is not wasted. Cotton byproducts are in everything from ice cream to wallpaper, from hot dog castings to uh, uh, hot dog casings to baseballs. Not to mention lots of things we use at home like cotton swabs, wipes, 
and even disposable diapers, right? There's no such thing as waste. So when you start to understand these things, then you start to see that there is profit in all of this stuff, right? Let's look at byproducts of hemp real quick. And this is one of my favorite, man, because when they outlaw marijuana, cannabis, they outlaw hemp as well, which is the non-psychoactive um, plant, meaning you can't get high from hemp the way you get high from uh, marijuana. But let's just look at a few of the byproducts, right? So it says on an annual basis, one acre of hemp will produce as much fiber as two to three acres of cotton. Right, side by side comparison. Hemp fiber is stronger and softer than cotton, lasts twice as long as cotton, and will not mildew. Cotton grows only in moderate climates and uh, requires more water than hemp. But hemp is uh, frost tolerant, requires only moderate amounts of water, and grows in all 50 states. Cotton requires large quantities of pesticides and herbicides. 50% of the world's pesticides is used for cotton production. Hemp requires no pesticides. Uh, no herbicides and only a moderate amount of fertilizer. On an annual basis, watch this, one acre of hemp will produce as much paper as two to four acres of trees. From tissue paper to cardboard, all types of paper products can be produced from hemp. So you take the hemp and you extract as much fiber to make the clothes that we need. And then with the leftover, the residue of the production of the clothes, now you make tissue paper, you make uh, cardboard, you make all types of uh, paper products. The quality of hemp paper is superior to tree-based paper. Hemp paper will last hundreds of years without degrading, can be recycled many more times than tree-based paper, and requires less toxic chemicals in the manufacturing process than does paper made from trees, i.e. our constitution and a lot of our documents that were uh, created to found this nation are on hemp paper right now. And that's why they've lasted a couple hundred years, right? Let's look at some other byproducts of hemp. Hemp can be used to produce fiber, a uh, board that is stronger and lighter than wood, sustaining, uh, substituting hemp fiber board for, um, for timber would further reduce the need to cut down so many trees. Hemp can be used to produce strong, durable, and environmentally friendly plastic substitutes. Thousands of products made from petroleum-based plastics can be produced from hemp-based composites. Uh, that's why this got outlawed along with marijuana, even though you can't get high from hemp, right? There are a lot of people who um, were heavily invested into petroleum-based products that now nah, we don't want to start using hemp products, right? It takes years for trees to grow until they can be harvested for paper or wood. But hemp is ready for harvesting only 120 days after it is planted. Hemp can grow on most, most land suitable for farming, while forests and trees require large tracts of land available in few locations, right? Hemp seeds contain a protein that is more nutritious and more economical to produce than soybean protein. Hemp seeds are not intoxicating. Hemp seeds uh, protein can be used to produce a variety of products from uh, made from soybean. You can use hemp seeds to make tofu, veggie burgers, butter, cheeses, salads, ice cream, milk, same thing you use a soybean for, you can use a hemp seed for. Hemp seed oil can be used to produce non-toxic diesel fuel, paint, varnish, detergent, ink, and lubricating oils. Because the hemp seed accounts for up to half of the weight of a mature hemp plant, hemp seed is a viable source for these products. Just as corn can be converted into clean burning ethanol fuel, so can hemp. Ladies and gentlemen, when we get into the production of the things that we need to survive, we can create tens of thousands of jobs. I want you to think about hemp alone. We will create thousands of jobs if we just 
took the hemp and turned it into fiber for clothing. But then if we took the hemp and we made paper and cardboard, if we took the hemp oil and made paints and varnishes and uh, bio biofuels and okay, come on, man, listen, we've got to understand that every other culture is in production and the manufacturing of the things that they need to survive. Our solution to overcoming our economic plight is to become as excited and as passionate and as willing to produce as we are to consume. I want you to think about that. If we got as excited, as willing, as enthusiastic, as hungry to be producers as we are consumers, where would we be in the next 25 to 50 years? Ladies and gentlemen, that's just a couple of generations. Where would we be if during this process, we sent our children to school to get specialized education? And guess what, y'all? It don't take eight hours a day to get educated. Three or four hours a day and the rest of the day, the children are at home on the family farm and the family business and the family meal and the family shop and the family factory and the family's manufacturing plant, learning the family trade, learning the family business, learning the family skill. And then let's take it one step further. The family grows hemp. And then if I'm looking at my family, I have five sons, right? We grow hemp. And we master the process of turning hemp into clothing material so we can make fabric shirts, whatever. But then I take one of my sons and say, hey, you know what? I want you to study the hemp seed and what it can be done as a food source. <clears throat> I take another one of my sons and I say, you know what? I want you to study the hemp fiber and I want you to develop processes of turning the hemp fiber into all sorts of plastic uh, replacements, containers, um, you know, plastic wear, uh, uh, food boxes and all of that kind of stuff. I take one of my sons and say, hey, listen, I want you uh, to, to, to focus on um, turning the hemp waste into uh, building materials for houses. And I tell one of my sons, I say, hey, while I want you to work closely with your brother, he's turning the material into houses, uh, building and boards for houses. I want you to focus on how these fibers can be used for insulation. And now we've taken one stream of income in the family business and turned it into multiple streams of income, but we maintain what's called synergistic alignment. The foundation is still the hemp, but we're just all working on hemp products in various capacities. And then when I grow the hemp and I turn the hemp into material for clothing, I take the waste in its various forms and I provide that to my sons. And now they're using the waste and they're turning the waste into money. So there's no such thing as waste, ladies and gentlemen. And we didn't even talk about the byproducts of wool. If you're growing sheep, then you know you can produce milk from the sheep. You know that you can produce cheeses and butters, right? But did you also know that the sheep bones could be used for certain things. Did you also know uh, that within the sheep wool, there is an oil called lanolin, right? It says raw wool contains 10 to 25% grease or lanolin, which is recovered during the scouring process. Lanolin consists of a highly complex mixture of uh, esters, alcohols, and fatty acids, and is used in adhesive tape, printing inks, motor oil, and other 
lubricant. There is no waste, ladies and gentlemen. But we don't know about this hidden money in manufacturing because we don't manufacture. We don't produce. We got to get back there, ladies and gentlemen. And we got to get back there quickly. And then to solidify this thing, we got to turn it into a family affair. Got to go back to where we are raising our children in environments where they're learning their livelihood as they're growing up. Because kids pick up more than they're taught. They're pick, they pick up more than they're actually taught. I want you to think about something. Did you teach your kid every word that they knew by the time they were five? Or did they just pick up a lot of those words in everyday conversation and dialogue because they were immersed in a culture where the English language was spoken by everybody everywhere they went? Well, guess what? You immerse your kids in a culture where the family livelihood is what's taught, what's talked about, what they're exposed to 24-7. They have master skills in a lot of areas by the time they're 12 years old. And even if they decide to depart from that and go do something else, they've got skill sets in them that they can always come back to. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me here at the Cortez Hustle Show. Be sure to go to my uh, monetizemylifenow.com. Grab your copy of the book. It's free. You just cover shipping and I'll get it right out to you. It's four incredibly simple ways to turn your passion into profit with little to no startup cost. Uh, that's it for today's show, man. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this series on Black Economic Empowerment. Do for self a six part series. Next week, we're going to focus on shelter. Next Friday, come back. We're going to focus on providing shelter. How many jobs can that create for us if we built and maintain and manage our own communities, residential properties and commercial properties, even high rises? What would that look like, ladies and gentlemen? That's what we're going to be talking about next Friday. So make sure you come back. Until then, I want you to get your money up because you absolutely can do it. But more importantly, you deserve to do it, each and every single one of you. Now hustle up.